Welcome to all of our local, national, and international colleagues. This is our November 8th, 2023 edition of the Global POCUS Collaborative, Cases from Different Spaces. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. We have at most 60 minutes together today. Uh, questions will be answered at the end by either verbally asking your question or via the chat box, if that option is preferable. Uh, please, everyone remember to mute yourself now to prevent any distractions during the presentation. Uh, we have a very special speaker today. I have the honor and privilege of introducing one of our global colleagues, Dr. Gita Nath. Dr. Nath's medical training started at Christian Medical College Valor in South India, followed by training in the United Kingdom at Newcastle upon Tyne. Dr. Nath has held prior faculty positions in several countries. These include Professor of Anesthesia at CMC Valor, India, a consultant in anesthetics at Addenbrooke's Hospital, Cambridge, United Kingdom, and consultant anesthesiologist in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. For the past 10 plus years, Dr. Nath has been a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care at Rainbow Hospitals in Hyderabad, India, where she practices mostly pediatric and obstetric anesthesia. Furthermore, she is the fellowship director for both the pediatric and obstetric anesthesia fellowship programs. Dr. Nath's areas of interest and expertise also include neuroanesthesia, difficult airway management simulation, and regional anesthesia. Her interest in simulation is evident by her involvement as a country coordinator for VAST, which stands for Vital Anesthesia Simulation Training. As a coordinator, her duties involve running simulation courses that focus on teaching non-technical skills in the perioperative period. And to wrap up her impressive background, for the past several years, Dr. Nath has been extensively involved with the WFSA, running safe pediatric and obstetric anesthesia courses and was recently selected to be a member of the Obstetric Anesthesia Committee of the WFSA. So without further ado, Dr. Nath. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, letting me join you in this really special endeavor, you know, getting everybody together to learn from each other about focus. So focus, as everyone knows, in, on the group at least, is point of care ultrasound. And today we look at point of focus in obstetric practice. Um, this is Hyderabad, all the various sites and all that, and pearls, because Hyderabad is called the city of pearls. So if anyone comes to Hyderabad, I think you should get some pearls. And uh, where I work is this hospital, uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital. So Rainbow Children's Hospital is the pediatric part and both right is the obstetric part of the uh, setup. Uh, and I work in both. So my objectives today are to see what how focus can help us uh, in obstetric anesthesia and obstetric critical care. And I look at gastric ultrasound, spine, the airway, and uh, I look at various aspects of obstetric critical care as well, but I'm not going to cover cardiac in uh, great detail because it's actually a, quite a large uh, uh, topic and uh, you don't want to skim through it too superficially. So uh, I'll concentrate, concentrate on a few things, okay? Um, one thing I look at uh, about each of these examinations is um, are they di different because of the pregnancy itself? Are they more difficult or do you have to change something because of the pregnancy? And also, how useful is e each of these uh, examinations and whether they will change management? Do we need to do these uh, routinely? Because anything that you want to do for every patient has to be simple and uh, not involve too much calculations and stuff. And also, we have our clinical way of doing things. Does ultrasound add anything to this clinical examination? So we'll look at all that. Um, I'll start off with uh, uh, ultrasound for gastric volume. This is one of the areas which was thought to be difficult because, because of the uh, gravid uterus. And you can't put the patient supine 
because that will press on the aorta and the IVC in the inferior vena cava and cause aortic cable compression. So, so we've got to modify the technique uh, in pregnant patients. We don't put them supine, avoiding so that we avoid uh, aortic cable compression. We we keep them up, you know, semi recumbent, and then we do one examination in that semi recumbent straight position, and then turn them to the lateral decubitus. And this is uh, one of our patients. Um, and you can see the gravid uterus and the fetal parts inside. So it is a little bit challenging because you look at the uterus and then you go up and try to search for it below the liver. Uh, you're just finding it there. there. So that is the uh, stomach. That is the gastric uh, antro. Okay. Now that we've found it, we can look at it a little more closely. As you can see, it's moving along with the liver, it's moving with the respiration. And you can actually look at the nice outline and, uh, uh, you know, do some calculations and stuff. And this particular scan is of a patient who was just going for a cesarean section. Just before she put her into the operation theater, we did this scan. So what we need to know is the gastric volume, because how much, what is the volume of the gastric contents, and is it uh, risky for the patient to have a general anesthetic? So as I said, the technique is uh, put her in a semi-recumbent position and we use a low frequency probe because we need to go pretty deep into the abdomen. And um, you look at the stomach, you look at the nature of the contents. So, and then you turn the patient to the side and then look at it again. And there is a semi-quantitative sort of qualitative kind of grading where uh, this is from her last. And if, if you find that the stomach is empty, both in supine and lateral position, it is a low risk. Whereas if you see fluid in the supine semi-recumbent position itself, you are likely to have more than 100 mils of fluid in there. So that is, that is considered a high risk uh, stomach. And we can actually calculate the volume. Uh, for that, you need to measure the uh, antral cross-sectional area, okay? So, and this is measured in the lateral position, lateral decubitus position, because in that position, all the fluid in the stomach comes to the antral, so that you can get a good idea of how much, uh, what is the volume of contents. And uh, there are two uh, formulae from which you can calculate the volume. You first measure the area, and then from that, use the formula to calculate the volume. And if it is more than 1.5 mil per kg, that's a high risk uh, stomach. Either you can uh, draw an outline on the ultrasound image, or you can take the long axis and uh, short axis and calculate the antral cross-sectional area from that, and then calculate the volume. So this is how we do it. You can see that the patient is sort of you know, uh, uh, propped up a little bit. She's not completely flat. And this is in the semi-recumbent uh, position. You can see where you put the uh, probe just to the right of the midline. And you can see that this patient has a little bit of stomach. This was actually three to four hours after her lunch. And uh, the diameter is small, but the contents look somewhat solid. -y. So maybe it's not emptied com uh, completely. Whereas the other scan is that of the patient I showed you earlier who was going for a section. It is completely black. The contents are completely black. So you can actually see the uh, appearance of the different stomach contents from what it looks like. The, uh, this target type of appearance is an empty stomach. This black thing is the gastric uh, mucosa. Uh, water looks like this. Milk looks a bit uh, milky, I suppose, sort of whitish. Water is black. And solid food can be seen as a uh, variegated kind of appearance. So you can make out what kind of contents are there 
by using the ultrasound as well. What is the evidence that it is useful or not? So, first of all, it is feasible in pregnant women. We can do it. That's the first point. And also many, uh, uh, this study uh, showed that 32 out of 500 fasted patients actually had full stomach. Though they have fasted according to the guidelines, you know, six hours uh, and two hours for liquids, whatever. But they still had, so many patients actually have a delayed stomach emptying, and nine of them had solid content, which puts them at a high risk for um, aspiration. The other uh, Arzola study showed that when different people uh, examine with the ultrasound, the gastric ultrasound, it is fairly good between uh, examiners. So there is good inter-rater inter reliability. Um, these two people, Arzola and Rukhomovsky, these are the two workers, the groups of workers who developed the formulae to convert the, uh, the antral cross-sectional area into a volume. Okay, and uh, a, a recent BJ Education has a good review of uh, ultrasound. So, how useful is ultrasound? When the fasting status is uncertain, definitely it's useful. We actually use it both in obstetric and pediatric patients. When we are not sure, you know, the fasting duration is not adequate, we just have a look at the stomach and decide whether it's okay or, uh, you know, wait for a bit. So it helps, definitely helps in differentiating a low risk versus high risk stomach. But should we do it in every patient? I don't know. As we were just talking, you don't have the ultrasound machine available all the time. Or, you know, like if you've got a, a bunch of theaters, you don't have a machine for each theater, each operation theater. So it's, uh, it is challenging to do it in every patient. And maybe it's not necessary. But maybe we should consider doing a gastric ultrasound before a, a general anesthetic in an obstetric patient, because we know that obstetric patients, pregnant patients are prone to have uh, regurgitation and are, risk, uh, are at risk for aspiration. So that's one thing we, we might consider. So we may not do it for the spinals, but if a patient is going for a, is a general anesthetic, maybe we, we have a quick look, it just helps us um decide how how extensive our precautions are going to be when we give the general aspect so that's about uh, stomach i'm going on to neuraxial blocks um the there's a very important uh, use of ultrasound when we are giving a spinal because if you look at these studies a lot of you know this uh, broadband study shows that more than two thirds of cases where they compared palpation to check the level of uh, space, spinal, the interspinal space, and compared it with MRI, the anesthetist was wrong in 71% of cases. So that's uh, that's a huge error. Um, and also, you don't the spinal cord doesn't end at the level that you think it does. It can actually extend further down. And again, when you put a needle in that place, you run the risk of uh, transfixing or, or causing damage to the spinal cord. So that's one. Uh, again, the study by uh, Locks, uh, the anesthetist was wrong in 40% of non-obese patients. And so half the patients, the anesthetist was wrong at uh, identifying the level. And actually, they were all like they, um, they were wrong by two or three levels, which is really scary. So one use is for identifying the level. The second is if, if the spinal is going to be difficult. For instance, if there is, if the, there is obesity or scoliosis, spinal deformities, any of these things, that uh, in those situations, uh, an ultrasound can help. 
so just because when you first start doing the spinal ultrasound it it the picture looks quite confusing and you know the structures look quite confusing so it helps to just uh, revise what the bones look like because the bones is what we can see with the ultrasound as you all know ultrasound waves are stopped by any bony structure so you can see as the view from the top view from the side and then view from the back as well and we do the examination obviously from the back so this is how we do the uh, you know uh, examination of the spine there are three places that you can look at it you know with the vertical uh, orientation of the probe this is at the um, transverse process this is the articular process and this is at the lamina so you can see that at the level of the transverse process you can see this trident kind of appearance uh this is this is the view that we look at when we want to give a lumbar plexus block because we go between the two transverse processes into the psoas muscle where we stimulate the lumbar plexus so you start off you can see this view and then come more medially to look at the articular process so this is view b and here you can see that uh, the articular processes are you know um, they are called camel hump appearance actually um, and if you come a little more medial this is at the level of the lamina so here you see the lamina you can orient the probe either straight forward or you can actually turn it somewhat medially so as you can see in this picture if you turn it medially you can actually look at the you can actually identify the uh, intrathecal space so that was vertical uh, uh, orientation of the probe and we can also look at the probe transversely and if you look at if you put the probe transversely and look at the spine you will see something like a stepple because the this is a spine and it has stopped the ultrasound waves going through and you can't see anything beyond that but if you come down and look into this space then you will see something like this okay so this is called the back wing appearance and inside here you can see the intrathecal space so if you get this view then you know that your needle also can go in that same direction and reach the intrathecal space and that's how uh, ultrasound for the spine works this is this is the this is one of our patients we are just doing a scan before her cesarean section so the first thing you should do is identify the level so you go down to the bottom count from count upwards from the sacrum so that you can choose which level you want to go to and then at that level you can turn the probe transversely and at the spine level you can see this uh, staple type of uh, picture and here you can see in our patient uh, that we can see the intrathecal space okay this is the dura and the uh, uh, ligamentum flavum and this is the anterior spinal complex this is the vertebral body and all that stuff and between them you can see the space you know a parallel thing again what is the evidence ultrasound during uh, spinal anesthesia or you know uh, epidural anesthesia it really helps with learning there is higher rate of success higher first attempt success all that uh, stuff uh, but there is this study whether it actually makes a difference for experienced anesthesiologists like people who are learning definitely it makes a difference but if somebody has already practiced for several years and is you know experienced in doing a uraxial puncture does ultrasound help this is uh, some more evidence 
And as you can see, somebody is not really smitten with the lumbar ultrasound because they are asking whether it's a useful gadget or a time-consuming gimmick because it does take some time. So anyway, just like when we started using ultrasounds for uh, central lines, first everybody said that, oh, we can do it you know, by the landmark technique. We don't need ultrasound and all that. But then all the guidelines came out saying, you should use it because it improves safety. I don't know if we'll get this kind of guidelines about uh, neuraxial blocks as well. So let's look at the usefulness. So if it's likely to be difficult, yes, it is useful. Like if you have obesity or the spine is deformed or whatever, it's useful for teaching as well. But do we need to use it for all the patients? I think one definite use is to confirm the spinal, uh, spinal level because as I said, the studies have shown that most often we are wrong in identifying the spinal level. Is this L4-5, L2-3, L1-2, what level is it? So, so that is one uh, use of it. I think somebody needs to be admitted. So whether we do it in normal patients, I don't know, but maybe we should practice in normal patients so that we at least know the technique so that when we do need it, we can uh, do it. So that was fine. Now I'm coming to the airway. Uh, pregnant patients, we all know that they have difficult, uh, you know, they're likely to have difficult uh, mask ventilation, difficult laryngoscopy, higher incident fourfold a higher incidence of failed intubation. Also, they have a high oxygen consumption because uh, they have the baby and they have themselves and they've got to uh, take in oxygen for both. And they have a lower reserve because smaller FRCs, so they tend to desaturate much faster than other patients. And if you look at uh, morbidity and mortality uh, statistics, you find that you know these things uh, adverse events happen at induction, but also at emergence. Pregnant patients, I mean, some of the studies have shown that somebody who has not had a general anesthetic also has, um, has had a poor outcome in the recovery room because nobody looked at her because of OSA, you know, morbid obesity. But anyway, airway changes do happen in uh, pregnant patients. And the airway changes are worse, you know, the airway becomes more difficult if you compare uh, non-pregnant to pregnant. And then during labor, the same patient's uh, airway becomes worse and even worse if she has preeclampsia because of all the edema. So, how can uh, focus help us? Uh, one is in a preoperative assessment to predict is this patient going to be difficult to ventilate with a mask? Is the laryngoscopy going to be difficult? And also to identify the trichothyroid membrane. We know that if you are in a cannot uh, intubate, cannot CVCI situation, we've got to go for a front of neck axis through the trichothyroid membrane. So if you can identify it beforehand and mark it with a pen or something, then you can immediately go for the uh, front of neck axis uh, and focus can help in identifying this membrane. Also, it can, uh, I'll show you how it will confirm that uh, the tube is in the right place and to predict if a patient will go into laryngeal edema after extubation by how much space there is, how much air column there is outside the tube. But anyway, let's come to the prediction. So this patient, um, the first thing we do is with the curvilinear probe, we look at the, um, the, the sagittal view above the hyoid bone. Okay. So in this uh, scan, you can see that I have measured the tongue thickness and this red line is the um, distance from the hyoid to the uh, chin. All right, the mentor. So there are measurements, and these are some of the consistent uh, 
numbers that have come from the literature. If the tongue thickness is more than 60 millimeters, or if the distance from the hyoid to the mentum is uh, less than 4.9. And there is another thing that you measure the hyomental distance in the neutral position as well as extended position. So there should be a difference. So the extended position, the distance should be more. That shows that extension is possible. So if the ratio between extended and neutral is less than 1.2, that means extension is restricted and therefore it's likely to become a difficult intubation. So basically, these are the same factors that we look at uh, when we do a clinical assessment. The tongue size we look at with Malampati classification, the hyomental distance we look at, and we look at extension as well. But the various studies have shown that this is these tests are a little bit better at discriminating between easy and uh, difficult. The other thing that is shown is if there's more, you know, soft tissue in front of the neck, that makes it difficult to expose the cords and do a good laryngoscopy. So the skin to hyoid distance and the skin to epiglottis distance. These are the two uh, measurements which are taken. And the skin to epiglottis distance is supposed to be better, better sensitivity, better specificity. And the cutoff is, in different studies, the cutoff is different, but above 1.8, definitely it is likely to be difficult. You can see in this patient, on A shows the skin to epiglottis distance. And here it is, uh, less than a centimeter. Whereas in the other picture, you can see that the distance is much more, 2.7. And this one is likely to be a difficult intubation. Now to identify the cricothyroid membrane, I said, you know, about the front of neck axis. There are two ways. The thing is, um, this patient is very slim. He's got a nice long neck. You can almost see his Adam's apple and trachea and everything. But all patients are not like that. Quite often they may be, you know, thick neck. They may have swellings. You know, it's difficult to see where is the, maybe the trachea is pushed to one side. So this technique is supposed to, uh, it has been designed to cover for all these factors. So first of all, go to the bottom, just above the uh, sternal notch, with the transverse view and identify the trachea. You can see, right? Then slide the probe to the right so that the trachea, you can see only half the trachea. Okay. And then, so you've un uh, identified the middle of the trachea. Now turn it vertical and then go up. You will see the string of pearls. If you go further up, you will see that um, the, a bigger, so all these are the uh, tracheal rings, but you'll see a bigger ring, then a gap, and then the thyroid. So this will be the uh, thyro, uh, cricothyroid membrane here, you can see on this uh, picture. So that is one way. Another way of identifying the cricothyroid membrane is some, this is a newer technique, I read about it just now, TACA, TACA. So uh, T is for thyroid, uh, A is for airline, C is for cricoid, and then again, uh, A is for airline. So what you do is first, you do a laryngeal handshake. So with your hand, identify the larynx and then put your probe on the larynx, you will see the vocal cords. Then slide down, you will see the air line. Slide further down, you will see the cricoid ring. Then slide up again, and you will see the air line. So this is the cricothyroid membrane. So TACA, this technique is called TACA, T-A-C-A. So either way, you can use either of these techniques to identify the cricothyroid membrane. These uh, pictures actually show the cricothyroid membrane in, mor in a morbidly obese patient. You can see how deep 
the uh, trichothyroid membrane is compared to the uh, from the skin. It is more than two centimeters, and and the uh, uh, vertical view as well. You can see that all these folds and all that again make it difficult to identify the trichothyroid membrane. I don't know if you are uh, all familiar with the Difficult Airway Society's uh, suggestion of what to do when you are in a CVCI situation. It's called uh, scalpel bougie tube technique. So what you're supposed to do is identify the cricothyroid membrane, stab it, turn it, and put a bougie and put a tube inside. Now all this thing you can do in a patient where you can feel the um, with the laryngeal hands, handshake, you can feel the larynx. But if you cannot, like an obese patient, you are supposed to make a vertical incision and identify the trichothyroid membrane directly. Anyway, this picture shows that here the tube is in the correct place, but here the tube is in the esophagus. So you'll see two little things instead of one round thing. That's how you identify esophageal intubation. Now coming to the evidence uh, about the focus and the airway, definitely ultrasound uh, indices separate, you know, they identify the difficult uh, intubations better than the, you know, better sensitivity, better uh, specificity. Um, and of course, in pregnant patients, several studies have shown that all the indices person, right? Um, you can identify, uh, you know, esophageal intubation, all that that we saw. Uh, the other fourth use is that there are several studies showing that it is useful in identifying the trichothyroid membrane. So our dilemma is, should we use focus for everybody? I mean, okay, it is more effective at differentiating between easy and difficult. But do we walk around with an ultrasound machine in our pocket? We don't yet do that. So I think really we need to uh, use our clinical methods. But if there is any doubt, we can uh, resort to um, ultrasound. But it's definitely useful if there is known pathology or trauma and for marking the uh, CTN, as we saw. Now coming to critical care. I'm going to talk about the lung ultrasound, hemodynamics, and intracranial pressure. Now, why are we interested in the lung? First of all, to assess any patient with dyspnea or desaturation, anything like that. Also, to help with fluid management. And this is the normal appearance of a... Uh, oh, sorry. This is the normal appearance of the... Uh, lungs when you look at it with an ultrasound. This is one rib and this is one rib. Yeah, this is one rib which is stopping the ultrasound and this is the other. And you see this uh, pleura and you see the lungs sliding. Okay. Yeah. And these lines, these horizontal lines are called the A lines and actually they are just reflections of the pleura deeper and deeper. Okay, So that's normal. And the normal uh, normal appearance, if you use the uh, M mode, you see something like this. You see a C on top where the uh, tissues above the pleura are not moving, whereas the tissues below the pleura are going up and down with respiration, so it looks like sand. And if there is pneumothorax or uh, you know pleural effusion or anything, then you don't see that sand, the whole thing looks like it's called the barcode appearance as well. And you can also see a lung point where at the edge of a pneumothorax, you can see the uh, sea and sand appearance on one side and no sand appearance on the other. So this, all this is um, some of the abnormal uh, appearances. This is an important thing. When there is any fluid accumulated in the lung parenchyma, you see B lines. B lines are vertical lines. They look like comet tails and they actually obliterate the A lines. Okay. 
and if there are more than three b lines that is considered abnormal when once you see these b lines how do you know what is due to that is that depends on how severe it is and also what is the distribution of the b lines if it if the b lines are because of cardiac failure they will be everywhere to be homogeneous so that no area is spared whereas if it is pneumonia or ards something like that the uh, there are areas with no b lines and there are areas with b lines so that's how you differentiate from the various patterns various distribution of the b lines and the severity several scoring systems are, are there in place uh, so this is normal this is 3 so this is abnormal here they are all merging together and the score 3 is it's almost become like the liver this is like consolidation so you do that in the various areas of the lung and add it up so that's that's how you get the lung ultrasound uh, score now this uh, this picture you showed i showed you before but these scans are from uh, one of our patients a 28 year old uh, woman who came pregnant and she came with dengue nowadays with the mosquitoes and everything actually we see a number of patients coming in with you know breathlessness and of various causes and this one happens to be due to dengue so borderline saturation while she is on oxygen and uh, she didn't need ventilation but uh, as you can see you can see the b lines here okay. and in the lower scan you can see that the b lines have all become contiguous and they are just moving together so pretty bad uh, lung uh, interstitial syndrome and luckily she went off without uh, going on to the ventilator she became better she didn't you know because our dilemma was that she's only 30 weeks pregnant we need to try and continue the pregnancy till the fetus is little better and uh, she became better and went home she will come back hopefully for uh, having her baby so that was about the lung now i'm coming to hemodynamics i'm going pretty fast uh, because there's so much hemodynamic assessment you look uh, what do we do we want to look at the fluid balance to give fluid or is she overloaded this for example you have a patient with pre eclampsia either pre or post op and her urine output is low for a couple of hours 2 3 hours what do you do do you give a fluid bolus and see if the urine output improves or will are you going to push her into pulmonary edema so in this kind of situation we can use ultrasound to um, guide us in fluid management so we look at the fluid balance we look at the contractility and we can look at other stuff like embolism or pericardial tamponade so intravenous i mean um, ivc inferior vena cava is a very useful um, uh, indicator to look at the preload and here you can see that the heart is here and the ivc is here and we look through the liver and we want to see whether how wide is this uh, ivc and does it collapse with respiration or not in the m mode this thing is going straight so ivc is full it's not collapsing whereas here you can see the the red arrow shows that the ivc has collapsed here you can see the ivc in a live scan so if the size of the ivc and how much it collapses or doesn't collapse uh, if you make a sniff and it collapses then she will take more fluid whereas if it is full it will not collapse so ivc collapsibility is one of the useful uh, signs for us this is our uh, dengue patient and uh, we are looking at her ivc we found it there because dengue patients actually are quite, usually they are quite fluid depleted we need to give a lot of fluids to because because of capillary leakage 
But in this patient, we saw that the IVC is quite full. It's not collapsing. So it told us like, okay, you don't need to give fluid in this patient because at the moment she is full. So it's not like a one-time assessment. Now she doesn't need fluid, but you will check again a few hours later whether she needs fluid at that point. Now coming to echo, like I said, I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail. Uh, we had a session on uh, echo in uh, one of these uh, talks, but that one say, you know, was about using the subcostal view. But uh, in pregnant patients, the subcostal view is not uh, easy. So we have to use either the parasternal or the apical view. And here again, we look for the cardiac filling, contractility, and right-sided uh, dilatation or strain in case it's, uh, there is embolism or effusion. Here, you can see that this heart is compacting nicely. You can see the uh, wall coming in. But in these other two pictures, you can see that the, the ventricle is a little bit sluggish. So it's, we don't, see, anesthetists are not cardiologists. We don't have to give a number to the ejection traction. But we need to know when we are managing the patient, whether this patient's contractility is okay or it's reduced. So just eyeballing is enough. And in this scan, you can see that the uh, chambers are just coming, uh, almost touching each other. So this patient is hypovolemic. Yeah. And in this one, you can see the pericardial effusion. Over here, you can see the pericardial effusion. Um, I have taken this clip from the FATE uh, protocol actually. So, in this patient, you can see that the RV is bigger than the LV. So, that's not correct. The RV should always be smaller than the LV, right? So, there is right ventricular dilatation with apical sparing. So, this is this diagnosis uh, points to um, some kind of embolism. In a pregnant patient, it might be either thromboembolism or amniotic fluid embolism. And the other scan shows that the femoral vein is not compressible. You know, that shows that there is a, um, a thrombus in the uh, femoral vein, which may have embolized. Okay, now, when a mother collapses, when there is hypotension or you know shock in a, a pregnant woman, we can use all these uh, tools uh, from the echo machine, from the ultrasound machine, to differentiate whether is it you know if it is distributed, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, or obstructive. Distributive we know is like uh, vasodilatation due to sepsis. Cardiogenic you will find that the uh, there is LV dysfunction, which you can know by the uh, echocardiogram. If it's hypovolemic, the uh, heart will be underfilled, the IVC is collapsible, and uh, you won't see anything on the lungs. Whereas cardiogenic, you will find B lines on the lungs because there is likely to be uh, pulmonary uh, edema. And if it's obstructive, obstructive may be either embolization, uh, you know, embolism because of uh, um, amniotic fluid or uh, venous thromboembolism uh, or tension pneumothorax. And here you get RV dilatation. The IVC is large and not collapsible and you don't find much on the lungs. So, you know, you can uh, use this grid to differentiate the various forms of shock in a patient who has collapsed. Now, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, using the ultrasound for intracranial pressure um, assessment. And what we do is we measure the diameter of the optic sheet, optic nerve sheet behind the optic disc. And this lady is actually um, a primary with preeclampsia, she had uh, you know two antihypertensives, and she uh, complained of headache as well. Um, 
so that worries us a little bit right so we looked at the optic sheath and found that it's actually not in normal size it is 0.48 cm there is another picture of a dilated uh, optic sheath here so this patient was okay she had her section and she was fine luckily she she had we gave her med magnesium and then you know uh, and then did a section she was fine a little bit about preeclampsia because this is one of the commonest conditions that we come across uh, in our practice maternal critical care what happens what uh, you know what do we find on focus in preeclampsia in the lungs we find you know about a quarter of these patients have evidence of uh, you know fluid in the lungs and the thing is this is seen before clinical uh, findings and or x ray findings as well and this is a warning to stop don't give any more fluids because you know that these patients are very prone to go into pulmonary then uh, uh, the cardiac and ivc uh, examination together they all these help us in managing the hemodynamics in a rational way now coming to the icp thing about uh, you know a third of patients a third of severe preeclampsia patients do have uh, onsd uh, increased that means the optic nerve sheath is uh, wide but my many more have headache or visual disturbance so really we are not really sure what uh, you know how to interpret uh, this and lastly of course the airway as we talked about in uh, detail um he uh, focus helps us in assessing the airway of preeclampsia patients whose airway is actually worse than pregnant and even uh, laboring patients because there is so much edema so to sum up um in the field of obstetric anesthesia we use the gastric ultrasound to identify a high risk stomach and maybe we want to use it before an obstetric uh, ga uh, the spine we identify the level of the spine space and uh, can be useful if the back looks difficult airway it is better discriminate gives us better discrimination than clinical uh, findings and we can identify the trachothyroid membrane and critical care we look at the ivc the lungs echo and looking at all these together it helps in managing the patient more rationally so thank you very much and happy spinal is there time for uh, questions um yes there is thank you very much dr nath for an excellent and very comprehensive presentation Um, at mm -hmm. this time, I'd like to invite anyone on this call to ask any question that you might have for Dr. Nath. Uh, please unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, hello, uh, this is Kitum. Uh, yes, go ahead. I missed the yeah the, the um, cardiac echo for hypovolemia. The Totally collapsing heart. I I missed it. I think I blinked and it passed me. Uh, thank you. But the presentation was very excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, the heart sort of empties during hypovolemia, so that uh, uh, you know you can diagnose that you have to give fluid. Was that your question? Uh, yes, it was my question. But if you could kindly show again, I, I missed it. I think I blinked. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Can you. Yeah. Do you still have control of the video? Yeah. There we go. Perfect. I was trying to hurry. This is the one. Can you see? Now I can see. Thanks. That, that's that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions for Dr. Nath?
Um, I have one quick question, uh, if I may. I know you mentioned uh, pre-procedure marking of the cricothyroid membrane in patients with a difficult airway, which is really an excellent use of ultrasound to help prepare in advance for possible intraoperative intra complications. Um, and I particularly like hearing about the and learning about the TACA method. Um, yeah. Is there ever a time constraint issue in doing this given OB emergencies, or are you able to mark these patients well in advance of such emergencies? Um, actually, it, uh, our population is not so obese. I mean, you see much more obese patients, especially even, you know, even the pregnant patients. So uh, we don't, we, I haven't marked the cricothyroid membrane for a general anesthetic because I haven't found a, you know, an airway that I think will be so difficult. We we have other stuff. We have our uh, you know video laryngoscope and we have the difficult airway trolley and all that. But uh, honestly, I haven't marked the CPF. And also, uh, I appreciate your extensive use of of ultrasound and the and the thoroughness of your presentation. Can you please describe any struggles or challenges that you've had um, with implementing POCUS in your hospital? One is that uh, it may not be available when you want it because somebody else is using it. Um, and sometimes there's no time, you know, especially obstetrics. Um, they just, you know, visit the patient in and uh, you don't really have that much time to uh, do stuff. Where it would have been you, sometimes you get stuck with a spinal and then you wish you had marked it before. <laughs> yeah, I, <guess> that. <laughs> I think the time issue, we all we all definitely have that same that same uh, concern on our end as well. Um, any other questions for Dr. Nath? All right, excellent. Um, thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation today. As a reminder, all of our POCUS videos are archived on our YouTube channel, and that link is disseminated and available in the monthly emails that we receive, or that we that you receive inviting you to the presentations. Um, our next POCUS presentation will occur on Wednesday, December 6th. As a reminder, presentations are scheduled to occur on the first Wednesday of each month. Our next speaker is a dear friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Corey Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson has a wealth of experience and knowledge to share on his topic titled Pediatric Regional Blocks. So we hope to see you next time. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Nath, very much for your presentation thank this morning you. and for uh, staying up late to give this presentation in your time zone. We really appreciate it. It was wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating today, and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.